Yes, you've got two for one today, special offer. You've got myself and Jacqueline. And as part of our um, series, we're going to speak on how to live an unoffendable life. Because that's important. And our prayer is that this comes across in the love of God, and it doesn't come across with any condemnation, and we pray you won't get offended. <laughs> and if you do, we'll, we'll pray for you at the end, okay? So it's not our intention. <laughs> okay. Before we can look at how do we live an unoffendable life, we need to look at some aspects of what offense is. Some of these you will know, and perhaps some will be fresh revelation. But it is important to look at these before we look at the steps to living an unoffendable life. Okay. I was going to ask you to put your hands up and do it. My hands are sort of half up because I had both my injections yesterday, and so I've been walking around like this most of the time. But anyway. In everyday life, how easy is it to feel annoyed or hurt by something that someone has done or said. Yeah? We have, or we will all, at some stage in our lives, take offense. I've done it, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that. The Greek word for offense means to displease, to make angry, to cause sin and entrapment. That's an interesting word when we're going to look through not taking offense, because it does entrap us. You know, the, dub, the devil just loves offense because it entraps us. And when he has succeeded in entrapping us, we begin to do his will, not the will of Jesus. We begin to display things like anger, resentment, criticism, which ultimately can lead to division, rebellion, and fighting. Such a fallout from one small action. Proverbs 18:19 says, A brother offended is more unyielding than a strong city, and quarreling is like the bars of a castle. Do you know, he's saying here that it is harder to be reconciled with a brother who is offended than it is to take a strong city. And that actually when we quarrel, we lock ourselves in. It becomes like bars of the castle. Alongside this discouragement, offense is one of the most potent weapons that Satan uses. He uses it in these last days to steal our destinies and destroy our lives. So, who are we offended by? Well, it's not a million dollar question, is it? Usually by others. That can be consciously or unconsciously. But you know, we can get offended by God. We can feel offended when he hasn't come through for us. Perhaps you've had a prophetic word over you and you haven't seen the fruit of that. Perhaps he's given you a promise and you're still waiting to see that. Perhaps you've got a long-term healing that you've gone to God again and again and you haven't seen him heal you. Or maybe there's a circumstance that hasn't changed. the way that we expected God to come through for us hasn't happened. And yet the Bible says we are not to strive, we are not to struggle with God. Isaiah tells us, Woe to him who strives with him who formed him, a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, What are you making? Or your work has no handles. When we actually take a step back and think about it, when we think about that we're taking offense from a God who has created everything, it actually seems a bit crazy, a bit stupid, perhaps a bit dangerous. 
Why would we take offence at a God who knows everything, created everything, has the best for us, as Bill said this morning, is a good, good father? Okay, so why do we get offended? Well, reasons differ, but there are some certain common reasons that cause offence, irrespective of who we are and where we're from. Because that's what we were born into. Jesus says in Luke 17 when he talks about temptation to sin, and he said to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he was cast into the sea, and then that he should cause one of those little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. We live in a fallen world, don't we? It's why we get offended. We are imperfect people. We are in the flesh. No human being is perfect. And if they tell you who are, they are, you need to pray for them. We all have a tendency to get offended. The psalmist says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. You know, we will daily encounter people with all kinds of experiences, traumas, fears, hurts, from their past, influences their behavior today. Paul says this in Romans, and there'll be a prize when you can tell me how many do's I'm going to read in this. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. You know, we probably all find that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Every person has an inborn tendency to disappoint and cause offense because of their human limitations. In the flesh, we are limited in the scope of seeing and understanding situations, hence our inability to make correct judgments. Do you know, when we start getting people in off the street... When your friends and neighbors come into this church, they're going to cause offense, knowingly or unknowingly, because that is the world that they live in. But we have to remember that we as Christians are born again. Our old self has died, has it not? We are now risen with Christ, and we have the Holy Spirit within us helping us to have the mind of Christ. Therefore, in being Christ ones, we are called to conform to his image. And his image is not one of offense. Another reason why we get offended is that people have differing opinions, ideas, and perceptions. You know, we live in a world that says, be yourself. The media tells us, be yourself. The news tells us, be yourself. It's your right to be yourself. It's your right to have your own ideas, your own perceptions, your own opinions. Unless it's against what my opinion is, and my idea is, and my perception is. Because then I'll be offended. We see it in every aspect of everyday life. Have freedom as long as it doesn't interfere with my freedom. 
Here's another reason why we get offended. The lack of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, we'll come back to this, but just to say that where there is offense, mistrust is an inevitable consequence. So what does offense do? Well, first and foremost, it disempowers us. It can separate us from those that we love and those that we're in a relationship with. We don't talk to others if we're offended, particularly the person who's offended us. Perhaps we won't even talk to God because we feel offended and right about how we're feeling. Offense can often lead to fear and isolation. The exact opposite of what is required of us, we need each other. We are that family together. We've read this over the past few weeks a number of times. Hebrews 10, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So what are some of the signs of that we have been offended? Well, the most common one is that we withdraw. We withdraw from relationship. We withdraw from friendship. We withdraw from fellowship. Relationships are created by God to strengthen and empower us. Godly relationships are designed by God for our blessing. When we begin to withdraw from godly relationships, from those relationships we've had because we are offended, then that is a good sign that we have taken offense. If we're no longer speaking to that person, if we're avoiding that person, the Bible says two are better than one, for they have a better reward for their labor. Yet, an offended person will stay away. They'll withhold their support. They won't contribute like they used to contribute because they are feeling genuinely hurt. They don't want to get hurt again. They want, don't want that bruise to get bashed again. People move away from their marriages because they're offended. People move away from their jobs because they're offended. People move away from their church because they're offended. People move away from friendships because they're offended. And in doing so, they lose the destiny of what God could have had for them in that setting because they've chosen to walk away. Another sign that we are offended or can be offended is resentment. If we resent someone, if we're annoyed by someone, that's usually a sign that we have taken offense. This in turn can lead us to disliking that person or this group of people because they've offended me. Our resentment, our annoyance, may have its roots in unresolved anger that could have come from negative events in the past, but the fruit we're seeing now. Resentment isn't helpful. It consumes our joy and peace of mind. It possesses a self-destructive power that leads to bitterness and unforgiveness, which can, and hear the word I'm saying, I'm not saying does, which can exhibit itself through physical symptoms such as fatigue, ill health, ulcers, and high blood pressure. Now, I'm not saying if you're sitting here this morning, well, if you've got all them this morning, we're going to pray for you. But I'm not saying your fatigue, your ill health, your high blood pressure, your ulcers are a cause of offense that has turned to bitterness and unforgiveness. But I will say this, in all the years that Jacqueline and I have ministered, we have come across people who are suffering physical symptoms because of unforgiveness and because they've taken offense. And once they've repented of that, their physical symptoms have changed. So I'm not going to say it doesn't happen. It does. But please don't read everything into that. What isn't there? What's another sign that we've been offended? Mistrust. Offended people can lose trust in others, losing the respect, the trust and esteem in the relationships they once had. 
Some who carry offense find it hard to submit to those in authority. And if that's left as it is, if it's not dealt with, if they don't choose to have somebody help them to not have that thought or not be offended, then it can develop a destructive, independent spirit. And that's not God's best for any of us. Colossians says, But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. Another sign that we are offended can be unanswered prayers. Jesus said in Mark 11 that if we hold anything against anyone, we are to give them so that, so that our Father in heaven may forgive our sins. God is God. He could go round that in our lives. But if we're choosing to hold on to unforgiveness, he won't move until you have dealt with that, with them and with him. Why? Because he's a good God and he wants the best for you. So why do we need to dress offense in our lives? In our life. Well, Jacqueline's going to come and tell us. Yeah, so I'm just going to take a few minutes to look at why we need to address this offense in our life. And first and foremost, um, we want the blessing and the presence of God to flow through us. And if we have offense, then this can stop the blessing from flowing. However, when we sort of invite God into our circumstances, you know, if we remain focused upon him and his word, then he can and will turn our circumstances and and situations around. And we will experience the the presence and the blessing of God in our life. Um, It's God's desire that we're not offended. He wants us to be dead to self. And if you look at Philippians 1, verse 9 to 11, it says, In this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. It's really important that if we are offended, that we lay down our offense, that we examine and we protect our hearts, because it is so easy, so easy to take on bitterness, entitlement, unforgiveness, you know. And when we take these things on board, the roots of our heart it's like, it's like the weeds begin to grow and grow and just get bigger. And if we don't pull those weeds out, if we don't tend to the garden of our heart, the fruit of our heart is going to wither, it's going to die, and the, the weeds of offense will just continue to grow. And one of our greatest responsibilities as Christians is to care for the health of our heart, is to tend to those weeds, whatever they are, the bitterness, the entitlement, the unforgiveness. I suppose... Um, An illustration that we're quite familiar with nowadays, everybody, the buzzword is talking about our well-being and we're good and getting better at taking care of our physical health, our mental health, our heart health. But we need to do the same in the spiritual realm as well. We need to take care of our heart spiritually because the arteries can become clogged with bitterness and unforgiveness and whatever And it will cause our heart to become hardened. And that is a hardness towards God and towards others. And we definitely, we don't want that. And I think a benefit of being church family together is is our connectedness. We're connected to each other. So what that means is that what we do has an impact on each other. So as church family, as Christians, we have responsibility to show love to one another. We have a responsibility to follow God's truth rather than our own desires. 
We have a responsibility which involves work, walking in the light and not in darkness. And to walk in darkness is to sin. It's to shirk the responsibility we have to our church family. I think what's, what's difficult is um, <clears throat> when we are connected as Christians, we put ourselves in a really vulnerable position. Um, we have a potential to do good with each other, but we also have the potential for harm because we're making ourselves vulnerable. We're taking the risk when we have a relationship to, to show each other, to, to reveal more of ourselves to each other. And in, and in doing that, we, we take the risk that we can cause each other harm. We can hurt each other. We can cause pain. Um, uh, an illustration, if you're a baker, is quite good. When it talks about it in the, in the Bible. Is it doesn't take much yeast to leaven a whole batch of dough. But it just goes to show, it only takes a small amount of yeast, a small amount of a tainting element. It doesn't matter how small it is. It can have a widespread and disastrous effect. Sin, another example, is you throw a pebble into water, it has that rippling effect. That's what sin can do in our lives and in the church family. And we have a responsibility to remove the old yeast so that we as individuals and as a church can live out our true identity. So in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7 it says... Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Old yeast represents ungodly and corrupting influences. And we want the church to be the bride of Christ, who she really is, holy, spotless. When Paul was talking to the Corinthian church here, Paul's goal was to encourage repentance for those involved and to restore the Corinthian church to health. That's what we want to be, a healthy church. Proverbs 4 verse 23 says exactly the same thing. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So the challenge today is to consider the areas of our heart where the weeds of offense, bitterness, entitlement, unforgiveness, you know, go on, name what you want, has grown over and needs pulling out. And we want to encourage you to invite God into those places to heal the heart from pain. And it's important because as we've seen, it doesn't just affect you, it affects all of us. And it produces a hardness of heart that affects the whole family. And it can stop God's blessing flowing through us. So unforgiveness that comes from offense keeps us imprisoned until we ask for forgiveness. So I just want you to look. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Matthew 18, verses 21 to 22. And it's a parable of the unforgiving servant Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. You know, in summary, this parable, it's really an impactful parable because the king wanted to settle his accounts with his servants. And there was one servant that owed 10,000 talents. And the servant couldn't pay, so the king, the master, whatever, ordered that he, his whole family, everything that he owned was sold as payment. And the servant falls on his knees and he implores him to, to not to do that. And out of pity, the king releases him and forgives him his debt. That same servant then finds a fellow servant who owed him only a hundred talents. But he seizes him, begins to choke him, and he says, you pay me what you owe me. And the fellow servant pleads with him again and says, have patience, I will pay you. But the servant refuses. 
So the other servants um, report this matter to, to the king. And in Matthew 32 to 35, it says, Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he could pay his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. Ouch. With unforgiveness in our hearts, God will keep us imprisoned until we ask for forgiveness. And there are only two keys to that jail. God has one and we have the other. We need forgiveness. You know, if God is a good God, and we believe he is, why would he keep us in prison? It's because he doesn't want us looking like the world, and he knows what being imprisoned with anger and bitterness can do. And it's God's mercy, his goodness, his compassion that keeps us in jail, that keeps us in that prison until we cannot take it anymore and we choose not to live a life of offence and unforgiveness. We've looked at what is offence, who are we offended by, why do we get offended, what does offence do, signs we are offended, and why do we need to address offence in our lives. I'm sorry if it seems a lot, but we wanted to do those bits before we move on now to how to live an unoffendable life, because they're important aspects that we need to remember in living an unoffendable life. To live an unoffendable life means you just live in a box and don't speak to anyone. And no, I'm only joking. We can't do that. Life won't let us do that. We're going to meet people, aren't we? We're going to bump into people. So it involves steps. And here are some of the steps in how we live an unoffendable life. The first step, be quick to forgive. Ephesians 4 to 32 says... Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Forgiveness means to release, to dismiss, to cancel debt or punishment due to a sinful conduct. It is the ability to release people, events, hurts and bitterness from your heart so you no longer feel angry with that other person. I think we'd all agree we live in a world that is so easily offended. It doesn't seem to take much now to make a mountain out of a molehill because of offense. But you know what? God cares more about the relationships than he does about who is right. Because Jesus says in Matthew 5, Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. We are... Instructed by Jesus through these verses to not sit back and wait for a solution when we've been in a situation where offense has been caused. Nor are we even to pray about that situation. It's no good saying, Lord, will you change that person? Will you change that circumstance? Will you bring down fire or whatever else? No, we can't do vengeance. Will you, will you pray love onto We We can't do that. That's not what Jesus says to do. What does he say to do? Go. 
Go and be reconciled. I'm a simple man. That's a simple truth. That's a simple request of Jesus. But we might smile at this. We all know what people do. They will talk to everyone else about what is going on, about the concern, but not the very person they need to go and speak to. I've probably done that myself, if I'm honest, in the past. It's wrong. When it comes to reconciliation, the goal is always connection from both sides. That's kingdom. Jesus said, if your brother has something against you, go to him. He never said, only go if it's your fault. See, the truth is, there are many times when the concern will not be our fault, when the situation won't be our fault. But that doesn't mean it's not our responsibility. And that leads us to the next step. Learn to confront issues biblically. Have you ever found yourself on a forgiveness merry-go-round? Around and around it goes. And it seems with the same person, you're always forgiving them. You're always forgiving them. You're always forgiving them. Or perhaps your forgiveness just seems to open up yet another door of wrongdoing to occur again. And you think, Lord, I've been through this door before. Well, maybe if that's your experience, it's a sign that we can't deal with this on our own. Maybe we need to seek counsel. Maybe we need a neutral, trusted person who has the interest of both parties at heart to mediate for the situation. Jesus says again in Matthew 18, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. See, the trouble is, people start by telling it to the church and not going to the person. And if he refuses to listen, even to the church, let him be to you as a gentle and a tax collector. That basically meant for a Jew. They didn't min mingle with gentles and they didn't mingle with tax collectors. So Jesus is giving us clear instruction of how to handle a conflict when someone has sinned or offended us. And it doesn't involve passive problem solving or powerlessness. Now sometimes there is a difference between sin and offense. Being hurt or offended by someone doesn't necessarily mean that they've sinned against you. Because sometimes we get offended by the truth. And when it's the truth, it's how we choose to react to that that's important. Will we take it as an opportunity to learn and grow? Or will we take offense it's like temptation temptation in itself isn't wrong the bible says that we are all tempted it's what we do with temptation that determines whether it's a sin we have a choice we all have a responsibility to keep our hearts pure and not to seek reconciliation one time and then stamp it with that didn't work because it didn't go our way. Forgiveness is a command of the Lord. It's a choice, not a feeling. It brings deliverance and freedom. God cares deeply about the offenses that could hinder our hearts. He knows what a powerful tool offense is in Satan's hands. Therefore, it is important that we put healthy boundaries in place in our lives, particularly when the other person isn't responsive to our efforts of reconciliation. A few years ago, Jacqueline and Kev did the Keep Your Love course on. 
That is such a good course in keeping healthy boundaries. Even if we have tried multiple attempts at reconciliation without a response, our response is still to be one of forgiveness. Paul says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Relationships are two-sided. We each play a part. Yet we cannot force someone to apologize. We cannot force someone to reconcile. We cannot force someone to seek to understand what we are saying. But as far as it depends on you and me, we are to live in peace with everyone. Our attitude is to be right, even if theirs isn't. Even if reconciliation isn't found, forgiveness doesn't depend on them for you. People often say, I have forgiven them, yet the pain still persists. Does this mean I've not truly forgiven them? No. Forgiveness is an act of your will. It's not a pain reliever tablet or dependent on emotions. Forgiveness doesn't always lead to reconciliation, nor does it always take the pain away at first. But what it will do is provide a foundation for your healing to begin. So another step that we can take in living an unoffendable life is to decide early that prevent Revenge. Revenge is not the answer. God has not given us the privilege of paying back evil for evil. As Christians, we are not allowed to take vengeance to, on anyone, irrespective of what that offense is. God is the only one who has the right for vengeance because he is all-knowing, all-powerful, holy God. So that leads us to the fourth step in living an unoffendable life. And it is the most powerful step of all. Walking in the spirit, not the flesh. Galatians says this. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. To live an unoffendable life is to walk in step with the Holy Spirit, not in our flesh. So that we conform to the image of Christ, not this world. Walking in the Holy Spirit is a life that will overflow with his fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness gentleness and self-control. This is the life that will keep us from taking and causing offense when we walk in step with the Holy Spirit. So, as we finish, Proverbs 4, 23 says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. The challenge to us, to me, is to consider the areas of my heart, your heart, where the weeds of, un, with the weeds of offense, unforgiveness, entitlement, bitterness have grown over and need pulling out. We have an opportunity this morning to invite God into those places to heal our hearts from the pain. We want to encourage you to think of the relationships in your life that have caused you pain, that have caused you offense. Bring them to God. Ask him to give you wisdom on what steps to take next.
Maybe it is to confront the issue, seek understanding with the help of a mediator, or to forgive that person, and maybe you need help to do that. And I want to say, if you have an offense against God because you feel he hasn't come through for you, then make your peace between yourself and God. Seek his forgiveness. You are powerful. You are not alone. God is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. I just want to give us opportunity to come before God now and um, just take time to, to ask the questions. Um, we're constantly being told to keep short accounts. So, you know, if you did this last week, great. Let's do it again now because life just throws so much at us. So I'm just going to pray. Yeah, Father God, I just want to thank you that scripture is our manual for life, that your word is holistic and it speaks to the whole person. It appeals to our head, our heart, our conscience and our will. And Father, reason isn't enough, but a change of heart is required. And we're encouraged to get alongside one another and help each other as it says in Timothy, with great patience. Yeah. Yeah, this shift in our will is a choice. So resentment, offence, anger, fear, it will all come knocking at our door. But we are empowered by forgiveness to leave that door shut. So Father, I just want to thank you now for your mercy. May no sin rule over me may no sin rule over us and I pray that you would fill us and you would make your face shine upon us today Amen Now I'm just in an attitude of of prayer I just want to lead you through um, a prayer that just may be releasing and for some of you if this isn't an issue for you then that is fine You just carry on just praying, just meditating. But I'm just going to lead us through asking God to show us any areas of our lives. And I'm going to leave space for you to just hear what he has to say. You may may hear an audible voice. You may sense something. You may see a picture. And if you don't, that's fine. You just continue to pray. So just... Follow me with this prayer in your heads. Father God, show me if I'm carrying any ungodly mindset, any offence or unforgiveness towards others, myself or you, Father God. Father God, show me where I first took offence, unforgiveness, or began carrying this ungodly mindset. person, people. So we're going to choose to release that person or those people. And it may be good for you to actually name that person. So I choose to release forgiveness to whoever put the name of that person. 
choose to release forgiveness. And I hand to you the belief that you, Father God, did not come through for me. And I renounce the lies and the mindsets I have partnered with because of this situation or event. Christians, we don't want that. We don't want the Spirit of God not to be able to flow through us. But if you've never asked Jesus into your heart, if you don't know him as your personal saviour, then there's a barrier and he can remove that. And if you would like to begin a personal relationship with Jesus today, I just want you to say this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I am sorry for the things I have done wrong in my life. And I ask you, Father God, for forgiveness. Thank you for dying on the cross to set me free from my sins. Please come into my life and fill me with your Holy Spirit and be with me forever. Thank you, Jesus.